From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. So, welcome to Wise Traditions, Guillermo. No, thank you, Hilda. Thank you for having me. I have been following you for some time, Nutriermo. You're known as Nutriermo, Dr. G, the man who offers the last diet. And I want to start with this, Guillermo. So many people come to you simply looking to lose weight, and they come away with vibrant health. Tell us the story of a woman, I think she was uh, named Patti, who wanted to lose some weight. What, what happened in that situation? She's an amazing woman, so powerful. She came to lose 200 pounds initially, and she was following my account for a couple of years, uh, did the 22-day no sugar challenge, then did a couple more challenges about uh, ketosis or eating ketosis and fasting, and, and she got track at some point, and she said, well, I've lost like 30 by myself, but I got stuck. Um, what if we do a short-term plan and then a long-term plan? I said, okay, what, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by a plan? Because our, our longer plan is one year. And she said, no, I want a two-year plan. I, said, I, I don't have it as a service. And she told me, well, please create it because that's <laughs> what I want. I said, well, <clears throat> that's what I call motivation. So let me talk to my management team and create a two-year plan for just you. And we did it. And now she has been for two years. She has lost 180 pounds. And she's not just at the end of the road and about to get to that 200 pounds, but she is now studying with us and becoming certified in modern nutrition. So she will be a coach other, other than a great, great, great testimonial. So it's probably one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had with a patient. It is so amazing. And yet I know you have helped transform so many lives. One reason we wanted to talk to you on the show is because your approach is such that you're not just trying to get people to lose weight in the short term. You're really trying to help them recover their health. Well, first of all, and, and, and I'm not saying this just to be humble and, and, and being nice to everyone. It's not me. It's not me at all. It is the body, which wants this. It's not my approach. It's our body's approach. It's not my opinion. It's our body's opinion. So sometimes when I have arguments with people, I, I tell them, listen, it's, it's not my take on this. It's your body's take. So if you want to get if you want to go against your body, go ahead. But don't don't argue with me because it's not me. So when you do the right thing, when you do what the body needs and what the body deserves and what the body um, is willing to absorb and, and use, the body will say thank you. And the way your body say thank you is getting healed from diseases or getting to the right weight on, on that person. So it's not me, it's the body, first thing. And if, if, we, if we're going to take a hero on, on these kind of changes in life, uh, changes on people, it's people. So those people like Patty or like so many people that change their lives, they are the heroes. I'm just a guide. And that <laughs> guidance is what lead those heroes to success. So, and, and I'm happy being that guide because that is what I think I've been born to. So I, I think that's my mission to guide people from point A to point B. And my mission is not just guiding them, but keeping myself up to date so these modern nutrition approaches, which is, <laughs> it's funny because the modern nutrition approaches that work is the ancient nutrition approaches that we have lost over time. As yes, that's probably. exactly what we say. It's like modern science is catching up to ancient wisdom. And that's, that's one reason we're so aligned, I believe. But talk to us a little bit more, Guillermo, about what you said a moment ago, that what the body needs and what the body wants. What is it that our bodies are craving and asking for? Pues, 
if, if you need to, you, you, you don't need to be like a magician to know. You don't need, you don't even need to be a biochemist or a biologist or a nutritionist or a doctor to use your common sense to apply the same things that we apply to other beings to just ask. What, what do I mean by other beings? If you have a plant, what, what are you doing with that plant? Well, probably the same thing that the ancestors of that plant had. If, if it's one of those plants that has been always on the sun, you need to put that plant on the sun. Just by the fact that it's a new plant, that doesn't mean that you can do different things from what that plant has in, in, in its needs. So if you have a cat, and if you're thinking, should I give this cat tuna or should I give this cat a salad? Well, it's not on you. <laughs> it's not a decision <laughs> that you can take. That decision comes with the cat because the cat had ancestors that ate certain things that had been conditioning his systems and cells and brain and muscles and organs to work with certain fields with to work with certain nutrient that have been given over time for thousands of years. So it, it, there's a belief now that I can choose how to eat based on the planet. And I encourage people to think twice when, when you want to eat thinking on the planet. First, first of all, because it's not true that certain foods like the plant-based foods are better for the planet. If you ask me, what's better for the planet? What's better for the soil, which is the base of, of the planet? What's better for the soil? Pesticides like glyphosate, atrazine, and all those agrochemicals, or the manure of a cow? You don't need to be an expert in any science to know that the manure of the cow is better for the soil. It's better for the insects that live in that soil and that gives life to that soil. It's better for the nutrients of that soil that feeds from that manure from the cow. And it's a cycle. That manure will bring more pastures. The, the cow will eat the pastures, will still create more manure. And that cycle is a never ending cycle that has been here on the planet for tens of thousands of years. Glyphosate, which is depleting our soils from the uh, vegetable industry or the fruit and vegetable and, and grains and, and legumes, all that kind of stuff. It's literally killing our planet, but we have been told the opposite. So don't think that not eating the foods that your body needs, that like the animal-based foods are good for the planet. Mm -hmm. But even if so, even if it's better for the planet, I don't think that getting sick or dying yourself will make an impact on the planet. So even if it could be good for the planet, which is not true, but even if it would be true, don't do it either because you have a life and you need to give your body what your body needs. Why? Maybe if you're here by yourself, well, then it's a different thing. You need to get a compelling way to keep yourself alive. But if you have children, you don't need to think twice because you are there for them and you need to take care of them and you need to take care of yourself for them to be okay. If you don't want to do that, please don't have children. But as soon as you bring children to this world, your number one commitment with them is keeping yourself alive and not playing games with food based on any stupid 2030 agenda that wants to keep the planet sick and hungry because it's what makes business for the companies that creates that 2030 agenda. Exactly. I think there's lots to take into account First and foremost, that you're right, we are here with a purpose. We're on this planet for a reason. And if our health deteriorates because we're trying to do something for someone else, <laughs> that isn't serving us or those around us well. So that's such a good point. Now, I know, Guillermo, kind of pivoting a little bit here, I want to say that a lot of people come to you and follow you because they want to lose weight. How did we get so far off course from? What serves our bodies best? How did we become so sick, basically, is what I want to know. So, for, first of all, finishing our last uh, topic, 
I think we are all here for one reason and just one. Making our humankind better for the next generation while having a great life experience during our path through this journey. So if we enjoy this life while making sure we will live a better world for the next generation, that's the main purpose. Living in a beautiful state, no matter what, because we're doing the right thing. And all these things are the right thing. And it's not because I say it, it's because nature, the body, biology, and biochemistry prefers those things that we have been taking and eating for tens of thousands of years. Yeah, yeah well, and just like you were making that contrast between the glyphosate, the pesticides, you know, the agrochemicals on the soil versus the cow manure, maybe this is one of the things that's caused us to gain all this weight and get so sick is that we're choosing the artificial inputs over the real food inputs. Do you agree with that? Of course, absolutely. And it's not just the food. We have been systematically depleted of the things that create life, like protein and fats from animals, like vitamins that are lipo, uh, liposoluble vitamins present in those uh, animal fats that we have been said are bad for us. So we have stopped cooking and, with them and eating them. So we have been stopping the use of uh, pork lard or beef tallow or any of the things that we started using. When, when I tell people at his beginnings, McDonald's fried their fries on beef tallow. Of course, not anymore. Now they use canola or one of those chili oils. But at the beginning, we were right. The problem is we have been getting out of the good things and adopting bad things. And one thing is clear. Ancient food is not causing modern diseases. Because if it could be like that, modern diseases would be ancient diseases. Modern diseases are caused by modern food and modern habits. And what are those habits? It's not just food. And that's the main thing I would love to add to, to this um, episode of your uh, beautiful podcast. That is not, nutrition is not just food. Nutrition is light. Nutrition is electromagnetic fields. Nutrition is water. Nutrition is so many things that have changed over the last 50 years and that have been conditioning our sicknesses and our modern diseases. And the reasons we have now as the three main causes of death in the whole world are, have nothing to do with the three causes of death from 100 years ago. Nothing to do. 100 years ago, we died by contagious diseases. Now, 100 years later, we have overcome those contagious diseases and now we kill ourselves. And it's like an assisted suicidal and gradually in which we die from diseases that we cause to ourselves, which is stupid, but it's, it's exactly what's happening. Wow. I had never thought of it before. We, at our own hand, were hurting ourselves. And then, of course, of course, the next generation you were just mentioning, like, how can we possibly equip them for their best and healthiest lives if we are slowly dying and think about it for for tens of thousands of years we have never had a supermarket we have never had uh uh, uh water at our houses like coming from a tap we have never had the commodities that, that we have today for tens of thousands of years we have lived out of the soil and with a backyard in which we had some chickens a cow a, a pork and that's it. If you have a backyard at the back of your property, what do you want to have? You want to have a broccoli that will get the space and will, you will have a broccoli twice a year and you will eat probably for one meal with that freaking broccoli. Or do you prefer to have a cow that will give you milk every day and as soon as you have that cow ready to eat, which is like three years or three and a half years, uh, not the milk cow, but the other one, the pasture cow. For, with just one cow, a whole family will eat for a whole year. So 
that's efficient and it's better for the soil and it's better for the cows because as soon as you stop doing that, you will never have cows anymore because nobody will have a cow as a pet. People, have, people great, grow cows and, and, and grow those pasture fields because they have been feeding humans for tens of thousands of years. And it doesn't matter, oh, but poor cow. Well, I do think that it's better to give three years of a great life to that cow rather than making that whole species to just don't exist anymore. So <clears throat> I think that should be uh, our take on this. Having, just Im imagine how amazing a chicken is. So we, we have corn. So probably one of the worst foods for a human because of the content of pesticides and because of the poor outcome that, that it has regarding nutrients. There's no nutrients. And it's not just that it has no nutrients but carbohydrates and, and, and some other anti-nutrients. It depletes you from nutrients. So if you, if you have an oyster, you will have 120 grams of zinc getting to your blood. Uh, sorry, micrograms of zinc per deciliter of, of, of blood. That's a study. It's a nice, nice study that shows you how if you eat the oyster, you will have the 140 uh, micrograms per deciliter of, because it's not what you eat. It's what gets, what makes it to your blood. What, what, what you, you get to absorb, right? Yes. Perfect. So if you have the oyster, you will get that. A huge amount of zinc in your blood, which is what you want. If you get that oyster with corn, you will get virtually no zinc absorbed. No zinc. So there are other foods like beans that will take 50% of the zinc. But corn will get 100% of the zinc cut. So you will get zero. So we have not just a bad food. It's a negative food. It's not, ju it's not just not providing nutrients. It's, it's stealing <laughs> nutrients for wow. you. And oysters don't have a price that you can pay and then not absorb the nutrients. So what can I say by that? that we have an amazing, amazing thing here. Imagine something, Hilda. Imagine that I talk to you about a machine. It's a modern machine that you can put corn in one side, the machine will process that corn, and from the other side of the machine, you will have protein, fat, Good protein, good fat, good vitamins, good minerals, and antioxidants. Would I know what like... machine you're talking about. Go ahead now. <laughs> that's a chicken. <laughs> you can feed corn to one of those chickens, and that chicken will put an egg, and that egg is packed with amazing nutrients. How amazing that machine is. And we are telling people, don't eat the yolk that has a lot of cholesterol. Give me a break. <laughs> exactly. Well, this is one place I know we really align is we understand the concept of nutrient density. Here at the Weston A. Price Foundation, we actually say, you know, everything can be on your plate. Fine. You know, have the corn, have the veggies, but the real bang for your buck is going to come from animal products. Primarily, we understand that the fat and the protein that you're describing. And one of your favorite, one of my favorite posts that I saw of yours was one that said, Creo que la grasa animal es vida. Animal fat is life. And I thought, oh my goodness, we could not agree on that more. Does this concept seem foreign to the folks who first get attracted to your work, Guillermo? Ah, uh, it's it's difficult, but I was thinking in something. And I think I missed part of the question. That's okay. Well, what I wanted to say was my mom's from Mexico. My dad is from Cuba. So as a child of immigrants, their people and their countries cooked with lard. They, you know, used tallow, all the things. But coming to this nation, they left it so that for the younger generations here, they see the fats and they get scared of the old fats when we know they're the ancient ones that served our ancestors well. I'm wondering how 
the public responds to your message that animal fat is life. And that's why I was telling you at the beginning that it's so important that people start using common sense and, and escaping from this narrative, which is a nonsense. If your father and mother and grandfather and grandmother use lard, please use lard. And if you can get lard from your original country, because there's a lot of shops here that, that, that sells you things from either Cuba or Venezuela or Brazil. There's a lot of like kind of specialized marts and shops that can take the same brands that you used to get at your country here in the U.S. And that's a good thing to do. So there's a reason why all Latins, when they come to this country, they get sick. This country is the most expensive healthcare country in the whole world where a broken ankle can cost you $100,000. And that expensive healthcare system should provide the number one longevity uh, marks in the whole world. That's why it's so expensive. But it's, it turns out you're not even in the top 20 countries in lifespan which is weird. So why do you want to go and leave to a country that you, you may make more money, but you're leaving less. So as soon as you start knowing that, you will leave less. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you eat. You can eat the same things here than you eat in your country. Here you get sick. Here you leave less than in your country because, okay, you will get milk, but it's not the same milk. Here in the U.S., it is the uh, recombinant RST, uh, BST, sorry, uh, hormone injected to the cows to give more milk, 30% more milk. So, and it's allowed and it's legal and it's illegal in every other country around the world. It's just legal here in the U.S. Atrazine, glyphosate, so many pesticides that are in your whole, in your grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables and all that push, all that narrative about eat your veggies, eat your veggies, veggies some fruits, veggies some fruits. That's a that's a that's the health key. No, no, health veggies and fruits are not the key for health, and we need to stop taking that bullshit as true. I don't know if I can say bullshit at your at your. No, program. no, you're not supposed to. So okay. change it for and, something else. And we need to stop changing that narrative because it's actually killing people. It's not just misleading people. We have cases, and if you go to Google and you, and you put that, and you put this, uh, dead baby vegan parents, just write that. You will have at least 20, 30, 40 different cases of vegan parents trying to raise vegan children and killing them. And here in Florida, we had a case last year in Cape Coral. Two, the two parents were sent to jail because they killed a, a, a baby just by feeding them fruits and veggies. If fruits and veggies cannot make a child even leave, not getting sick, even leave, you cannot tell me that that's the key for health and life. No. Right. And as you pointed out in your own post, I think I saw it on Instagram, this, the animal fat is life. You were actually talking about a mother's milk and how a mother's milk is full fat and has cholesterol and has the things that the baby needs to grow. So what would make us think, like you said, except for industrial propaganda, that going in another direction and avoiding these natural fats and natural cholesterol and the health giving proteins and fats would do us any good where we've been brainwashed. Those parents have been really manipulated by the mainstream narrative. And it's not just, and, and you need to know where's that narrative coming just to understand the whole picture of why are you being told yeah. that? So first thing that you need to understand is everything that is important for life is in the only food that, no, that nature has created for us, which is human oh, Yes. So any, every other food on the planet has not been created for us. We just take them. But it's not that nature created this for the human to be healthy or to live up to 100 years. No. We have made it 
to take whatever we had around to keep ourselves alive. And now you, we have different takes based on uh, if you're from India or you're from Colombia. It doesn't matter. But we, have, we all have a past and we all have a need. And the need is mostly similar for everybody. So out of that thing that I just told, you, it's probably 95% of the same things that we need. So it's not that every human being is created, no, not every human being is created equal. Well, yes and no, but 95% is equal. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you need to change that 5%. But okay, as soon as you have the most important things, the other things are like a game. And if you look at uh, mother's milk, and that was my uh, PhD for six years, I was studying human milk on uh, antioxidants, minerals, and, and the kind of fat. And you, you can understand which food is good for you or not based on the understanding of human milk. That was my blessed. I, I, as soon as I started understanding human milk, I started understanding all the foods. And there's one day, Ilda, that I received a call from a national uh, TV channel here in the U.S. because it was bacon day. And they called me and said, well, we don't have anyone saying good things on bacon but you. So you need to come <laughs> <laughs> for, for bacon day because we have a panel of five guys like throwing uh, all kinds of bad things on bacon. So we, we need you to kind of have a game. I said, sure, let me go. And I went. And it was in the middle of the pandemic. So I didn't, I, I did it from, from home. Okay. But I prepared, I went back to my PhD uh, uh, book and I took all the fats, uh, fatty acids, sorry, the fatty acid profile, and I compared that to the fatty acid profile on bacon. And it's like almost exactly the same. Same fatty acids, same amounts, same proportions between saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. How are you telling me that bacon is clogging my arteries if it's the same kind of fat that nature has decided? That's why I'm telling you, it's not my opinion. It's yeah. nature's opinion. So if nature decides, and we, are all, we, we all agree that the content in human milk is not by chance, is, is because we need it and we have been evolving for that. And if you study uh, human milk, it's not the same composition the first day, then the second day, then the third day, then one week later, then two weeks later, it changes. So it's, it's a live fluid. It's an intelligent fluid. That if you, if you are preterm as a baby, nature will give you certain stuff. If you are a term baby and you are healthy, you, you will be given some other stuff. When you have fever, you will be given one thing. When you are sick, you will be given another thing. So it's amazing how nature can change that liquid. So don't think that is made by chance. There is intelligence, natural intelligence behind the content of human milk. So as soon as you don't think that nature want to clog your arteries when you are just born and a baby, it's stupid to think that bacon is bad for you or for your arteries. So when you understand how important it are, saturated fats are for you or for your system or for your hormones or for your immune system, you can understand why people is so sick because we have been told that saturated fats and cholesterol, which is the main life components, are bad for us. And as soon as we have stopped eating fats, we have started eating carbs in excess because there's two things that makes a food pal palatable fat and sugar. If you take fat away, you need to put sugar or you, you taste nothing in your food. And that has created a whole industry that has been benefited on this for the last 60 years. But as I said at the beginning, and maybe I, I'm talking too fast. And, and <laughs> too, no, no, and not at all. Um, but I want to hear what you're going to say. And then I have another question. Okay. So just one thing, and it's probably the most important thing I will say today. Every single problem that we have right now with the food chain and the narrative with the pyramid and all that kind of stuff is based on the profits of three different industries that are probably the three most powerful industries in the world. It's the big food, 
big pharma and big agro. So big food is companies that create the food that, is, that are basically 10. Conagra, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle, Unilever, one of the, all, all those 10 big companies. Big pharma, which is people that creates the drugs, and big ag, which is the people that create the agrochemicals, Syngenta, Bayer, uh, Monsanto in the past, that, that was bought by Bayer, just to clean the name, and DuPont, all those companies that are owned by the people that control the whole world, like the DuPont family, or, or all those families are the families that really run the world. And they created that, that agrochemical industry. We all know about big food and big pharma. They are all friends because one industry created the problem, the other industry fixed the problem. And it's all a very big friendship that they have. And there's one reason that the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. It comes together. Oh. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a food administration and a drug administration. They're friends. They, they, they did it together. Uh, let's do the Food and Drug Administration. Let's, let's be a family because they are a family. They go together. So when, when you get into a pharmacy here in the U.S., you don't find the drugs at the beginning. You find the drugs at the end of the pharmacy, at the bottom, at the very That's bottom. Right. And for you to get to the very bottom of the pharmacy, you will find a lot of food. It's the only country on earth that you will find a supermarket inside a pharmacy. And in all, all those uh, lines in that pharmacy are packed with Doritos, Chocolates, there are more chocolate brands on a pharmacy than is in a chocolate shop. And you will find even beer, alcohol, cigarettes, everything that makes you an addict and everything that makes you sick can be found on the pharmacy before you get to the place where the drugs are. That's again, food and drug friendship. Wow, I have a light bulb going off over my head right now because you really put the pieces together. I mean, Guillermo, I thought we were just going to talk about weight loss, but you're helping people <laughs> redirect their vision and, and open their eyes to see what's contributing to their the weight gain and the sickness that all goes hand in hand. You want to remove them from those big systems of big food, big pharma, and big ag, and introduce them, reintroduce them to life the ancestral way. Because I have been teaching people on how to lose weight for 20 years now, and I have realized that it's not enough. The only way to get people to a really safe place where they lose that weight and they keep that weight out forever is that you teach them for what's the problem and why is that a problem? So as soon as you identify an enemy, that enemy cannot attack you anymore. The problem is before they identified that as a friend and they said, no, take just a little bit for just a little bit of time. And then you go back to eating the same crap. So people lost weight, then regain the weight. That has been going on for 20, 30 years. Oh, I have a rebound. How, how do you call that in English? Like a Yeah, it's called a setback or something. Or I, I fell on the way. Well. Sure, because you're still thinking that that thing is good for you, just, just avoiding that thing for a little while. But if you identify that whole industry, not just that food, not just the, the cookie, but the whole sugar and flour industry, and why is that industry so powerful, you will understand why. Let me tell you, that cookie that you're watching like a prize for your baby or as a prize for you for after meal or for before going to bed, there is a whole mafia behind that cookie and when you see evil behind that cookie you start not watching that cookie as funny but creepy an oreo cookie and i'm not sure if i can uh mention go for it name names it's fine perfect so an oreo cookie has evil on it it's not cream it's not white cream it's evil and let me tell you why do you remember the food industry drug industry and the agrochemical industry so in order for you to get to that cookie you need to have a, a food industry telling you that grains are good for you right and 
those companies that create the USDA or that feed with money the USDA are the ones that influence the parliament that has cereals as the main, at the basement of the parliament. So if you have taken that narrative, paid scientists and created that um, parliament, now you have that, that cookie is perfectly compliant with what your body needs because those grains that the wheat and the corn or whatever it has as a base with sugar and, and seed oils is good for you. Then you have been said that all of that grains, like that wheat in that Oreo, seed oils are good for you because we have been said that we need to change the saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats, which are the ones that a Oreo cookie contains. But that's not true either. We, we have been talking about how saturated fats are natural and good for you. Polyunsaturated fats are ultra processed and bad for you and super inflammatory. But when you put in the whole cookie, wheat, sugar, and polyunsaturated fats, seed oils, that is extremely inflammatory, extremely addictive, and extremely uh, guided, guiding to sickness. So the pharmaceutical industry will be happy that you became an addict, that you have high blood sugar, that you have a food addiction, and you are getting sick. And you get diabetes or any other related to um, your either um, obesity or autoimmune disease, just starting by that. And then the agrochemical industry needs you to buy more wheat and more seed oils for them to keep selling the agrochemicals to the wheat world, to the wheat crops, and to the all those crops that are plant-based. So that cookie is evil. It's feeding the three industries that are making us sick. What can you do to go against these three industries? Don't do like me doing posts in social media and getting your account shadow banned <laughs> by, <laughs> by those industries because they, they, they are the ones that advertise the most on Instagram. So when you go against them, Instagram punishes you. Like they punish my account every time I do a post about Coca-Cola or whatever. But don't do that. That that leave that on me. I will take that risk for you. The only thing you can do is eat animals. Because when you eat animals, you will eat less. So the big food will be hit. You will get sick way less. So the pharmaceutical industry will get hit by your actions. And there's no agrochemical involved on raising cows, pork, chicken, eggs. Or whatever so you will hit the big agro company and now you know why all those three industries are putting a lot of money into netflix documentaries and a whole kind of narrative that is telling you don't eat meat don't eat fish don't eat eggs don't eat day don't eat dairy and all those things and all those nutrients which are what you need if you don't take them, you will get sick, you will eat more, and you will make a business for the agrochemical industry. That's the whole story. Guillermo, you have made an excellent case for identifying the enemy. And if I look at an Oreo cookie differently from now on, it's thanks to you. <laughs> but let's just say I'm convinced intellectually, this is right. These things are out to get me, keep me sick, uh, sideline me, and make profits for others. But what if I'm genuinely addicted? How can I get released from the clutches of the sugar and the seed oils and the grains that are not properly processed? Well, we have a challenge uh, sometimes of the year. We have a 22-day no sugar challenge, an 11-day no sugar challenge, even a four-day no sugar challenge. And we have been teaching for the last five years uh, to the whole world on how to get rid of sugar and, and food addiction. Because I hear people say, oh, I'm addicted to food. No. I'm a, I'm a, a, a how, how do they call it? An emotional eater. No, no, no. You're an addict. If you would be an emotional eater, you would eat eggplant whenever your emotions tell you that you need to eat. But you, you, don't, you don't do eggplant. You don't do broccoli or, or a cucumber when you want to eat because you're sensitive to something. You, you want sugar and cakes and cookies. So... Call that by its name. You're an addict to, to sugar, not to food. <laughs> food is so broad. You're an addict to sugar or flowers or anything with sugar and flour together. So um, when you call things by its name, 
you can identify the enemy. And if you want to win a war, you need to know who your enemy is and what is it. And sugar is the, is the enemy at every cost. Of course, bread is the second enemy because it causes, again, a whole bunch of crazy stuff. When, when we read uh, that book, Grain Brain, that was so, but so enlightening in that sense. And we knew more stuff from that book from, than from the 20 years uh, of science that were happened before that book. So, of course, bread is the second, is the silver medal on uh, <laughs> the cause of diseases, but sugar is the number one. And if you would cut sugar from the world, seven, if not more, out of 10 diseases would simply go away. Seven, if not more diseases. Seven out of ten diseases, if not more, will yeah. be completely uh, disappear. Well, um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up soon. Otherwise, I would ask you more questions about that. But I have two questions to pose here at the end. One is, Guillermo, have you experienced some of the transformation as you've stepped away from these enemies uh, for improved health? Tell us a little bit about your own story here. And, well... My story is probably a special story. It's, it's, not, it's not something that I necessarily recommend people to do because I'm on my own journey. But after leaving all of this, and, and you need to know that my story is made out of a lot of experience that is pretty difficult to find around. So it's, my experience in life has been pretty unique and, and it's been unique enough to create experience and knowledge to get a take that is pre pretty well-based. So I'm from Spain, probably uh, the country that will be Japan in 2040 in <laughs> lifespan. So I'm from good genius because Spain is a, is, is a place where people live a, a, a long life. Uh, then, I have been living in Italy, where I studied a year, another uh, year in London, when I studied also in the Trinity College, another year in uh, Ireland. Then I moved to Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador. Then I ended up in the US. So all those places that I have lived have made me understand what food can make to a certain population. And it's not the same thing that in that you eat in Italy, that I lived also in Sicily for a whole year, <clears throat> I gained 30 pounds in that 11 months that I lived in, in Catania, Sicily. And that made me have to lose those 30 kilograms. And it's not easy. So it, it's like 65 pounds that I have to lose myself. And that taught me a lot. Then England taught me a lot about their food. They are the only country in the world that don't have kitchen. So they don't have their own cuisine. You can get mm. to a Spanish restaurant or a Japanese restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, but there's no English restaurants. <laughs> there's no, really, no UK <laughs> cuisine. So they are really bad on their health because they don't have anything to eat if, if it's not coming from all the people. And that creates no culture other than, I don't know, roast beef and fish and chips which is not, <laughs> roast beef is okay, but you cannot create a cuisine out of one food yeah. or, or one preparation. So it's pretty unique too. Then Central America made me see the other side of the problem. After studying obesity, I started watching what malnutrition is. And you cannot understand nutrition and the importance of certain food until you have had a baby in your hand that is going to die if you don't give that baby right now, the right nutrients. If you feed that baby grains, corn, legumes, beans, fruits, or vegetables, that baby is going to die. If you feed that baby animal foods, that baby survives and gets healed and get into a normal person. So don't tell me in this first world which nutrients are important for you and your health as a human being until you have spent at least four years like me in that country that people is dying for malnutrition. That's how you know 
which nutrients are key for health. And after doing all of that, I came to the U.S., I got 20 pounds again, had to lose them again, <laughs> and I really understand what's happening in this country. And my journey, and that's my final answer to your question, I decided three years ago to live on a carnivore diet because three scientists that I respect a lot started doing it, and I decided to try for a month. Then I extended it for three months. Then I extended it for a whole year. And now it's been three years that I don't eat one single vegetable, one single fruit, one single piece of grain, or one single piece of legume. The only thing I eat is meat, fish, eggs, cheese, avocado, and olives. And there's a whole, I, when I say just, so imagine how many different animals and how many different parts, nose to tail, you can eat. Imagine yeah. how many things from the ocean you can eat, from a snapper to a octopus going through oysters or scallops there's a whole bunch of recipes and different animals that you can eat and dairy there is a whole bunch of different cheeses all around the world that are great and a, a whole bunch of k2 vitamin uh dense foods that there's not in any other food and there are eggs from a lot of different birds and stuff that i didn't know of till now so those are dense foods they are packed with the right nutrients that we have been having for a long 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 time and i was expecting like getting sick or craving for some kind of nutrients in one year i don't need vitamin c even if i take it for just uh i don't know just when i feel i'm getting sick which is which is probably unexistent i got COVID once and it took me one evening to get rid of it. The next day I was feeling better. The next day I was okay. So wow. it's the, only, the key for the immune system is vitamin D. Vitamin D is made out of cholesterol. Vitamin D is made out of things that are in animal foods. There's no vitamin D in plant. Well, it's D2. It's not the same that what you need, which is D3, which is in animals. So the key for long-term health I am pretty sure that it's on animals. I don't recommend people to do this because I'm in, I'm in my own journey. Yes. And I may take fruits and other stuff in the future because I honestly think fruit is not bad for you. It's just bad for you because we have been using too many pesticides and agrochemicals to grow fruit the wrong way. But because if you do fruit the, the, the nature way, probably you will have crickets, worms, flies, birds, raccoons, <laughs> and a whole bunch of animals that will eat the fruit before you do. That's, That's I, I have a house in, in Florida with three mango trees. And man, you need to be a PhD to get one of those mangoes <laughs> when, it's, when it's time to, to eat it. Because we have a lot of animals that will eat the mango before me in that <laughs> property. So well, I love easy. your insights. I love that you've said your journey is your own. I I do want to remind folks, we have like 11 wise traditions, dietary principles, but we suggest that people adjust them according to their own bio individuality. We don't think, you know, grains necessarily need to be off the table or legumes or seeds or nuts if they're properly prepared, but people can do like you did in terms of using their common sense, paying attention to who the real enemy is and seeing what serves their body best. So I, that's a wonderful, wonderful um, so much information that you shared with us, but I want to ask you one last question that I always love to pose at the end here. Guillermo, if the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? Cut sugar at all costs and at all amounts. There's not such a thing as a little bit of something that creates addiction. You get a little bit, you get addicted. So the number one measure that I would tell people to do is just cut sugar. Sugar is evil. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure, Guillermo. My pleasure.